All right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a few questions for you today. Ben. Okay. Um, the first one has to do with uh, the term thinking now occurring for the first time, which I think is uh, uh, one of the first terms I heard in coming across your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that in your classes with the New York Philosophy Corporation and in your books, um, something that you've, it's a term that you've used quite often. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could, um, first of all, just walk us through what that term means. Okay. Thinking now occurring for the first time. Um, I had thought for a while recently, in recent years, not, having go not, not being addicted to reading my own works over again, that I had come across that gradually over the course of the development of the thinking. But uh, in preparation for this interview, I went back and I looked at the prolegomena to Novitas Mundi, which is my first book. And the prolegomena is that portion of the book which first addresses head on the, the thinking now occurring. And I've, I discovered, much to my surprise, that I actually used the term uh, uh, in the prolegomena to Novitas Mundi. Uh, it has a number of connotations. Uh, his, historically, it uh, connotes the notion that this particular form of thinking is unprecedented um, in human consciousness, all right? So that we have a history of thought, which again is one of the givens, so to speak, one of the assumptions, one of the basic understandings uh, 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 that I have personally, and that the thinking now occurring, of course, incorporates, right? Um, so if you start with the notion that there is such a thing as the history of thought, there's a history of the automobile, uh, there's a history of uh, um, of a, of a nation, right? There's, uh, you have a history, you have a biography, you have a certain history. Um, so in other words, the fundamental assumption is that human thought and human consciousness is not a happenstance, um, potluck kind of uh, uh, collection of thoughts, but that there is at the deepest level of human consciousness exemplified in the thinking of what we would take to be the major historically uh, important uh, thinkers in, in the Western tradition, um, that there is a, well, Hegel would say there is a development of thought, right? Um, one might say in a slightly non-Hegelian uh, context, there's something like an evolution of thought. But in any event, there is some real relationship between the preceding and succeeding phases of thought. So when I go from Plato, for example, in the ancient world to Aristotle, Aristotle is not starting from scratch. He is first, literally, a student of Plato for 20 years. Uh, so he must have learned something. And he shared with Plato certain fundamental notions about the reality of the world. And then given those notions, but also combined with his dissatisfaction with the way Plato understood how those notions could be related to the world of our experience, he, Aristotle then, created, as it were, his own philosophy, which in a certain way is quite original. There's no question about that. But on the other hand, starts from and is intelligible really only in terms of what had preceded him in the history of thought, and most importantly, and proximately, uh, Plato's thinking. Right? I mean, there are others, but we don't want to do a lecture on the history of there thought per se. Yeah. Right, OK. <clears throat> so, but I, I use that as an example. And then um, if I take Plato and Aristotle as the uh, summits, as it were, of classical thought, there's more after that, of course. Uh, down into the period of the Roman Empire. There's Epicureanism and Stoicism and uh, skepticism, etc. Uh, but all of those um, further ramifications and articulations uh, coming down from the uh, Aristotelian Platonic inheritance, all of those uh, um, uh, offshoots or developments uh, 
nevertheless share a certain common understanding about reality. If I put that very simply, and it's, it's a gross oversimplification, but I think it makes the point clearer. For any ancient thinker, in one way or another, not always in the same way, all right, and not in a way that precludes any notion of dynamism and uh, change altogether. For example, Heraclitus is into change. Uh, but nevertheless, at bottom, even for Heraclitus, for whom all things flow, all things change, nothing remains the same. Even for him, the fact that all things flow had no beginning. Uh, so ultimate reality, no matter how I define it for an ancient classical thinker, is that which ultimately doesn't change. Ul so change, if this change, if there's nothing but change, change doesn't change, right? Change, it's always been changed, it'll always be changed, right? It's that constant, there's no real beginning, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, reality doesn't begin, reality is, and the classical way of understanding this, of course, it's an eternal reality. So the flow is eternal, or the platonic ideas are eternal, right? right. Uh, or the gods of the uh, Aristotelian universe, uh, they're eternal beings, right? Okay. We can't fully understand what the thinking now occurring means if we don't somehow or other start there, and I do that, by the way, I do start there in a different way in, uh, in Novi Testamundi. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, again, there are a lot of things that we wouldn't be appropriate to try and uh, do justice to with this, in this context. But broadly speaking, what upsets the apple cart of classical thought is the advent of Christianity. And Christianity is the fulfillment of a Hebraic, Jewish understanding of the nature of the world as that which God, a single God, a, a God who is one and not one of the many gods of the uh, Greco-Roman world, that God is understood to have created the world from nothing, right? So right away, uh, in Judaism and in Christianity, which uh, understands itself to be the fulfillment of the Jewish understanding of the relationship between the creator and the world, creation, right away we have, we have introduced in what becomes historically a very powerful and, in fact, overwhelming movement in Western civilization, um, we have introduced the notion that reality, meaning by reality now, the reality which we understand the world to be, had a beginning, right? It's not eternal, right? Or if there are elements of it that will not cease to be because of the nature of their composition, they nevertheless had a beginning. So we have, we have uh, indestructible entities like souls and angels and so forth in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which translated in terms of thought, uh, the thought form, philosophically if you want, uh, uh, are created eternities, created immortalities, right? Okay. So right away with Christianity, we have a major, major shift uh, in the history of thought. Um, and that works itself out over the course um, in an intellectual way as such with a certain con continuing integrity without losing touch with itself, so to speak, if I can put it that way. It works itself out over... Um, the first 1500 years uh, AD up to the um, up to the 15th 16th century all the it begins the we begin we can we can detect the emergence of what will become a kind of modernity that we're much more familiar with experientially um, in maybe the uh, in the 14th century even um, but nevertheless um, it for, speaking broadly about 1500 years of development of, of of, of thinking that continues in one form or another to be directly under the influence of this, under, this Christian understanding of the world as created. If I back up a little bit, because this is not unrelated to the question, uh, although it's, it goes beyond the question as you asked it. Um, Let me, let, me, let me say that one of the characteristics, we can come back to this, one of the characteristics of thinking now occurring uh, 
is that thinking now occurring as a thought form, as a thought form now actually existing in an absolutely unprecedented way, is characterized by the fact that it, qua thinking, qua essentially new form of thinking, has no concept, no category, no notion of self. Right? So if I were to look for markers of the thinking now occurring, uh, it would be this complete or absolute absence of the notion of self as a category of thought. Right? So in other words, it just doesn't come up. Right? Okay. The reason I bring it up in advance is that in this development from classical to Christian thought, and I would say roughly, sp I'm speaking a little bit loosely here, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. I think in response to the shock of the incarnation, all right, in other words, the idea that not only that the world was created ex, ne ex nihilo, which to a Greek would have made no sense, right, but to a, to a pious Jew made all the sense in the world, right, uh, and to a Christian, uh, not only was the world created ex nihilo, but uh, that creator God in the person of his son, a member of the Trinity, which is another separate issue, uh, actually assumed became a human being like you and I, right? Well, that's ridiculous from a, for certainly from a Greek rational point of view and maybe from any rational point of view hitherto, okay? All right. Um, so that notion of the incarnation, I think one way of understanding in a kind of uh, homey way, I'm going to be a little homey about a very abstract topic, is that it triggered the development of a self-consciousness that would not have been there in the form it turns into over time were it not for the incarnation. In other words, I'm going along blithely, happily, living in a world in which uh, nothing ultimately changes and nothing is really therefore, there are going to be no big, big surprises, right? Um, and uh, all of a sudden, I have the creator of the world becoming human in a way that blows my mind, if I can use a modern expression anachronistically. Uh, and so in blowing the mind, the pre-existing mindset, a new mindset has to take shape. But part and parcel of that taking shape is an awareness of my limitations as a human being, or in, in more particularly in this context, as a human thinker, right? Uh, so I become, in that sense, self-conscious in a way that even Plato and Aristotle were not quite, because they were not confronted with anything that challenged their fundamental assumption. The incarnation challenges the then current fundamental intellectual assumptions about the reality of the world, uh, and I'm, I'm suggesting that it it creates a kind of self-consciousness, but it does so gradually, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing like modern, full-blown uh, Cartesian self-consciousness. Uh, that takes some time to happen. But it's there in, the, in what we, we would refer to as the early uh, Middle Ages and into the late Middle Ages, into the high Middle Ages in the 13th century. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, the gradual development of this uh, self-consciousness or self-awareness as an ingredient in what otherwise remains uh, in continuity with Christian faith. Um, take, for example, Augustine, who, when he speaks of God philosophically, ontologically, uses the expression in Latin, id ipsum, or ipsum id, literally translated the, the very it. You might understand in the context of the very thing. He, he, is, he is the thing itself, we would say in, in English. Um, 800 years later, Augustine is about 400 AD. He overlaps those centuries before and after 400 AD. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, roughly 800 years later, uh, in the 1200s, uh, when he speaks of God analogously to the way Augustine does. Uh, he speaks of God as ipsum, 
esse suum. You can, in Latin, you can reverse the order. It's not important. Suum ipsum esse. So what we notice there is that in Augustine, we have the notion of esse as taking the place of the id, right? um, the it. So it's a more dynamic, explicitly being word. It's the act of being. The ipsum is there, as it was in Augustine. It's the very act of being. God is the very act of being, just as in Augustine, he is the very thing. He is the very reality, as it were. Um, but Thomas adds, casually, I mean, not, without making a big deal out of it, right? This is the point, right? This is a gradual, uh, somewhat insidious development <laughs> from the point of view of the thinking now occurring. Uh, he just casually adds to the phrase, already modified, uh, in a constructive way, by the way, a uh, very original way. It has a lot of profound implications intellectually. He adds suum, his own very being, right? Uh, so he's already got this, the, he's already got this self-reference, uh, reflexive self-reference, more to the fore. It's always been there, right? Uh, there's a reflexive self-reference in Augustine's uh, work. But it's not, he certainly doesn't apply it to God. Right? He's careful not to do that. Uh, and even when he applies it to himself, it's, it's not substantive, right? In other words, he, he, Augustine, despite the most recent translation I read of his uh, uh, work on the Trinity, uh, never uses the word self as a noun substantive. And the reason he doesn't use it, it doesn't exist in Latin. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't exist in the analogous uh, uh, place in, uh, in the Greek language, right? Um, so anytime you see a translation of um, uh, out of the Greek or the Latin about the self, you know that it's being filtered through a modern self-consciousness, and it's it's uh, it, it distorts the the the, the, um, the um, spare use uh, of the notion of identity um, that's characteristic of of ancient thought. Um, Okay, now uh, let me go back. Uh, uh, I know this is more than you want. <laughs> you asked the question. It's your, you have to That's suffer the consequences. That's exactly what I wanted. I do, <laughs> I do have a couple questions that you can ponder as you're keep, keeping on asking this. Would you say that that development was necessary in some way? Not at all. Not at all necessary. <laughs> no. Okay. No. But it happened. Absolutely. It absolutely, absolutely happened, happened, but it wasn't necessary. It and was. that's an important issue which okay. we should talk about more generally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, because the modern mind t think, tends to think that if anything happened, it happened necessarily. Right. Right. And uh, with the exception of my good friend Kierkegaard, who points out that nothing comes into existence necessarily. Mm. <laughs> uh, so there is, there is some pushback. Uh, but the pushback in the case of Kierkegaard in, in the 19th century requires him to admit uh, that his understanding of faith is a complete absurdity. Mm. Right. So he's got a problem. Uh, spiritually and uh, psychologically, uh, that you might say he ought not to have, right? Okay. So uh, even the mere the, the mere development or the the coming into existence of this self consciousness isn't necessary, as far as you uh, can see historically. It wasn't necessary. It was something that happened. It happened. But it could have been circumvented, let's say, or well, something it, else well, could have or, happened. Well, uh, it might not have happened. That's it all. That's all you have to say. It, it, it was. It was it could have happened, it did happen, but it need not have happened, right? right? Okay. Uh, it reminds me, just to get off the topic, but it's the same topic, uh, ironically, it reminds me of Adam and Eve, right? Uh, was it necessary for Adam and Eve to sin, to fall, to lose the grace of the initial creation and to create the world in which we're living? Uh, Hegel would say yes, because he's the modern man par excellence. Mm -hmm. If it happened, it must have been necessary, not only necessary, but good. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but in the context of the thinking now occurring, you would say, well, it did happen, but it need not have happened. Mm. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it's very difficult for the modern mind to think that anything actually happened that need not have happened. Right. Because <laughs> it has a, it has, it's a control freak. The modern mind is a control freak. Right. And necessity is its projection of its passion for controlling, both in understanding and otherwise, uh, the world. 
Would you see that that is something that's coming out in the world uh, these days in terms of our obsession with technology and our obsession with? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't. Uh, uh, technology is is um, is not in the thinking now occurring per se. It's not an issue. Yes. It's not an issue. But self consciousness is an issue. Absolutely. And there's a way in which you you want to distinguish in your constructive work the thinking now occurring from what absolute self consciousness has been in modernity. Correct. Yeah. And in order to do that, I want to go back to where I was when you interrupted me with these very provocative questions. <laughs> well, I'm glad you so, remember where you were. <laughs> yeah. Well, so am I. <laughs> so uh, when Thomas speaks of suum ipsum esse, his own, speaking of the, who God is or what God is, right, the nature of God, his own very esse, act of being, I said that act of being substitution for the uh, id of uh, Augustine is, 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 is profound, right? It has far-reaching implications. What it comes down to, skipping all the intermediary steps, is that in uh, Thomas's thinking in the 13th century, and we're getting close to what, in retrospect, we know is going to follow, which is modernity, right, more or less. Uh, that focus on uh, being translates in terms of the nature of thinking, what I'm calling thinking, right? The f thought form, the form of our consciousness, the categories in which we understand the world, right? Uh, those are different ways of, because thinking is a very abstract term. Everybody thinks, right? But in a, in a formal and um, rigorous sense, the philosophical, fundamental thinking uh, that goes on in uh, human history, and of which there is a history. In Thomas's case, his originality is that he, in effect, creates, again, not sitting down, not in a Cartesian way, which will come later, in a kind of Descartes meditations. He quite deliberately creates a new method of thinking about the world. Right? Uh, I don't think Thomas could be, we could attribute to Thomas such a kind of deliberateness as we find in, in Descartes in the, uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, right? But nevertheless, de facto, and not necessarily, uh, he creates what I call the transcendental form of natural reason. The first key term there is transcendental form of natural reason. And what that's, and, and then the transcendental form of reason, natural or otherwise, becomes a given for people like Descartes and Kant, and in his own very original way, uh, transformed in Hegel. Uh, but go back to the, my, my way of understanding the thought form, the new thought form mm -hmm. uh, that we find in Thomas as a transcendental form of natural reason. So leave natural out of it a moment. It's a transcendental form of reason, which means this. If I went back to Aristotle, using him as my touchstone, right, as a kind of place from which we measure the differences, uh, if I went back to Aristotle and asked him, what happens when the mind knows something? And Aristotle will tell me that what occurs in the act of knowing not the act of thinking, by the way, which is often, again, mistranslated all through the 20th century by people who don't know their Aristotle. In noesis, in the act of thinking, uh, which transcends reason, right? So in other words, maybe I should back up a little bit. The act of knowing. The act of knowing transcends reason. Mm -hmm. now, that's strange to us. Should be, right? Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have, as human beings, for Aristotle, we have a reasoning power. We reason. Right? We're logical, and literally in Greek, of course, we are the zoon ekon logon, mm. the living being that possesses or has the logos, has reason. Mm. That would be a normal translation of the Greek. That characterizes us as creatures, as it were, using creatures in a non-biblical uh, sense, as, as uh, natural entities in the world. That distinguishes us from other animals in Aristotle, because we have the logos in a way, certainly in a way, that the other animals don't have it, right? They don't have it at least characteristically. 
Uh, however, what that means is, what, uh, but in order to contextualize that, we have to understand that there's more to mind than reason. There's more to mind than reason, okay? More to the act of noesis. And no so way. noesis is to be distinguished from dianoia, from thinking, okay. from reasoning, mm -hmm. from reckoning, right? The act of knowing, which is a kind of instantaneous, mm -hmm. although Aristotle wouldn't quite speak that way, right? But in our, our language, get a sense of it, just a sense of it, right? It's, it, it transcends time. So in that mm -hmm. sense, even instantaneous is a little misleading, right? But it's, it, it's an act of knowing that, qua act of knowing transcends the temporal world in which we ex have our experience. And our thinking is geared, as it were, to our temporality. But in the, and it's a preparation for, it's a precondition for, in our case, the act of knowing. But the act of knowing exists in the universe independently of um, the rational animal. It exists in the case of all of the gods, right? Despite the fact that, thanks to Thomas Aquinas, we have this blurred notion that somehow the, we can speak of Aristotle and God in the later sense of the word uh, in an intelligible way. Literally speaking, this is false, right? Aristotle, read the metaphysics, there are, there are, uh, there's an unmoved mover who is the one among 55 such unmoved movers, maybe 47, he says, right? But in any event, a plurality. So you have to understand that Aristotle, the real Aristotle, is a metaphysical polytheist. Mm -hmm. he, hasn't, he hasn't lost touch with his Homeric classical Greek roots, all right, in terms of worldview, right? Um, but the, all of those gods, including the unmoved mover, do nothing but know. <laughs> right, I'm making a distinction between knowing and thinking. They don't think, they know. Uh, when they know, because they are by nature eternal beings, they transcend temporality and therefore there's no need for them to go through a process of rationality, you see? Yeah. Right? Uh, when they know, they know, again, bad choice of words, as it were instantaneously compared to our figuring it out. Okay. But we have, says Aristotle, just to complicate things, because Aristotle didn't want to make it easy for anybody, because he suffered under Plato for 20 years, so he figured he'd pass it on in his own way. <clears throat> what Aristotle says is, in order for the human reason, the logos, to work in the human being, that is, to work in the sense of, to work, number one, and then to come to fruition or completion in an act of knowing, there must be in the human soul a divine element. I could say, without doing real injustice to what he's talking about, there must be, as it were, now that he wouldn't speak this way, a little god, mm -hmm. right? So there's a god in all, as Thales, his uh, pre-Socratic predecessor, started off by saying, there are gods in all things. Well, Aristotle, again, just assumes that, and therefore in the human soul there is a god. In the case of the human soul, it functions as the actualization of an act of knowledge, the condition for which, in the case of the human logical animal, uh, is a uh, experience of the of the world uh, as we experience it temporally. Right? Okay. Now that's all by way of saying what does transcendental mean? Mm -hmm. Transcendental is something completely different. All right. So you could say then that the act of knowing in Aristotle, looking back transcends reason, right? So when, re when the human being knows something, it transcends itself, qua human, qua rational, right? It doesn't completely transcend itself because within its being is this divine element, okay? And this divine element uh, is that element which actualizes the potential knowledge of the rational animal and makes it an actual knowledge. But in that actual actuality of that knowledge, here's the point, the knower and the known are identical. Even this is, well, this is not bad. Aristotle actually speaks of the, uh, of the divine mind uh, 
uh, contacting itself. Mm -hmm. So this is not a bad metaphor even in an Aristotelian universe. But that contact is one which, as my hands are trying to indicate, doesn't leave any room between the knower and the known. And in that sense, they become one or identical, indistinguishable in the act of knowledge, right? Um, so trans to create a transcendental form of knowledge, which I'm, for which, to whom I'm, for, for which I'm giving the credit to, um, to Thomas in the 13th century, is to have an understanding of the act of knowing, not just, the, not just thinking, but an understanding of the act of knowing in which that, I want to say, and I'm speaking analogously here, I don't mean this literally, right, but as it were, the open, well, I'll use the word opening so I don't have to apologize. That there is an opening that doesn't go away between the knower and the known in Thomas in the act of knowing, right? It's obviously in reasoning about the world, it's not an issue. There's, and what do you mean by opening there? I mean a lack of, of simple identity, okay. to put it in the negative, right? right? Uh, so not one in some way. Yes, and the uh, technical uh, term is that when in Thomas, the n mind, the knower, knows its object, what we call its object, the known, um, the opening takes the form technically of the fact that what is known of the object by the mind is the similitude, the likeness of the object. So is there a unity of the object and the mind analogous to the unity of the known and the knower in, in, in Aristotle? In, is there such an uh, identity or unity in Thomas? Yes, but it's not direct. It's mediated, as it were, by the notion of similitude. Yeah. Similitude becomes, by the way, and you see this very clearly in Descartes' meditations, it becomes uh, interchangeable in uh, Descartes with the word idea. Okay? So it, the idea is a, rep, a more characteristic uh, Cartesian understanding, is that the idea is a representation, a representation mm -hmm. of the known object. Right. Now for Thomas, when I have just this... One, real quick, with your physical analogy, right, there's just like a little opening there, right? So that's well, I, uh, Is that too uh, literal? Uh, yeah, I think. You have Aristotle. Yeah, I don't think we have any contact. I mean, I would say. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't have. We don't get that. We don't get that close in, in Thomas. Okay. So opening suggests that there isn't a contact relationship okay. between the knower and the known, except insofar as there is a unity. There is an identi an identity of the similitude of the object with the, with the knower. Right. There are a lot of in interesting things that can be said about that, but I'll skip over them. Right. I said that the full line to describe this is the transcendental form, transcendental now, where in the act of knowing, there is an opening, there is a, there is a continuing difference. Mm -hmm. all right? There's a noticeable, you might even say, as it were, if you could get inside the mind, you know, you say, oh, look at that, that's still there. <laughs> right? yeah. I haven't, lo haven't lost contact, I, well, pardon me, I have lost contact with him, but I haven't lost sight of it. That might be better, right? Um, and um, so in that opening, I have the transcendental idea, the transcendental form of reason, that's what we're talking about. So now, oh, so I should also add that. Once I've done that, then I've weakened. If not, I, I would say in Thomas, it's, again, all of this has to be somewhat oversimplified, but fundamentally, um, I haven't eliminated altogether the distinction between nous as act of knowing, noesis, and dianoia, or reason, or thinking. Uh, but I've weakened it. I've weakened it because now you could say, um, in order to know something, or the capacity to know something, belongs to reason. Right? So, uh, because reason is. Reason is quite used to the opening between itself and its objects, mm -hmm. see, the world. Uh, uh, and once I allow for the act of knowing 
um, to have such an opening, which would never have had in Aristotle classically, um, then I, I want to say, I, 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 we can't go into it, right? But I want to say it's, it's at least weakened the, the distinction uh, between, not that it vanishes in Thomas, right? But it weakens the distinction between intellect and reason. Intellect being the Latin medieval term for what is the equivalent of that highest part of the mind in Aristotle and Plato, which knows things as opposed to merely thinking about them. The you know, we sometimes can translate it into pretty straightforward language as understand, mm -hmm. right? But even understanding uh, uh, has a kind of rational flavor to it, right? which it probably would lack in both Plato and Aristotle. Okay, so transcendental form of natural reason. Now, now the word I'm coming to last is natural. Mm -hmm. This is a reason for Thomas, for which he has no reason to doubt, <laughs> that it has access to a natural world which is real. Right? So, in other words, even though my access intellectually to the world from the starting with the mind is mediated by likeness or similitude, Thomas deliberately rules out the possibility that I'm really involved in a solipsism here. Hmm. That, I'm re that, that when I know the similitude of the object, I'm really knowing nothing but what we would call my own ideas, mm -hmm. right? And he, and I quote, by the way, I quote the passage somewhere in, the, in that relevant section of uh, Novitas Mundi where he does that explicitly, right? Because uh, he says, in effect, that if I have the similitude of something, um, uh, it's not a pure negative. In other words, I can't have that similitude without a, without affirming uh, the reality of the object of which it is the likeness. I mean, that's, a, that's not as subtle as Thomas, but that's, that's the notion, right? So, okay. So, but the bottom line is simple. He has no doubt uh, that the mind knows the natural world, even though now it knows the natural world in a way that's ontologically, epistemologically, however you want to phrase it, radically different from the classical understanding. It's implicit in everything I'm saying that this is a part and, part and parcel of the consequence of the development of the history of thinking or the outworking of the history of thinking as a consequence of the incarnation. But I, I don't want to go directly down that path. Because take me it's also that. related to the notion of self that the... Well, here's how it's related to, related to the notion of self historically. Descartes is I think universally acknowledged as the uh, founder of modern philosophy, and, and maybe in a certain sense the founder of a, my, of a, of a, of a modern understanding of, of, of science, or, or science both in our narrow contemporary sense, natural science, but also more generally, as Hegel likes to emphasize, what it means to know things, right? So in other words, Descartes starts out, taught by the Jesuits, who are always involved in all kinds of mischief, uh, Descartes starts out in the 17th century completely fed up with um, uh, all previous philosophy, all previous uh, science and so forth, uh, and he wants to start from scratch. Okay? So he, there's that deliberateness that I don't think we find anywhere else previous to Descartes. Right? So he, he deliberately sets out to um, start to find a, founda a new foundation, uh, you could say a, a new form of thinking, and I don't mind saying that even though the thinking now occurring it can be defined as a new form of thinking, because the difference is going to be that the thinking now occurring is an essentially, essentially new form of thinking, which have a number of connotations, but I'll hold that a moment, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for new forms of thinking, well, you have, you have Augustine over against uh, Aristotle, mm -hmm. you have Thomas over against Aristotle and Augustine in different ways, right? And now you have Descartes, who in a certain sense is even more radically, more deliberately, s starting from scratch and, and uh, create, means to create, intends to create a new form of thinking. Right? Uh, now he restricts, now what's interesting, especially in light of uh, contemporary mindless culture, is that when he enters into the meditations, he tells us, I think elsewhere in his, uh, in his comments on what he did, uh, in any event, I must uh, refer to the details in uh, Novitas Mundi. He tells us that he's going to doubt everything because Thomas Aquinas has taught him that the human mind, qua human now, 
right? Even though it's made some advances in our look at the backwards in history, I mean, I, I, uh, Thomas wasn't quite doing what I'm doing, right? I mean, he's not, he wasn't framing it the way I'm framing it, but nevertheless, the human mind, for whatever differences it had from Aristotle, nevertheless, was inherently a dubious thing. That, uh, you might say a doubtful and doubting thing. In other words, what the human mind it could not do was to say anything with perfect certainty, right? It's, so even it's, and you can see it's built into the idea of similitude too, because even the idea of similitude, uh, even though it's in touch with a real object, it's a similitude. So we never know, in fact, Thomas is really radical on this point. I, I mean, I really like it. Uh, <coughs> I think in this way he kind of anticipates the American pragmatist. Uh, this is, that's off the cuff. Because what he says is that the human mind in knowing, even in the act of knowing, as he's reworked it de facto, um, doesn't know the substance of things. In fact, unlike Augustine, who thought that we damn well did know the substance of ourselves, the sub pardon me if you use that expression, uh, uh, the substance of the human soul, right, would be a more careful way of putting it in Augustine. Um, Augustine thought that, right? Uh, but Thomas denies it in a very clever way so that he can be, remain consistent with Augustine. Uh, but he denies that, so we begin to see the we, we begin to see the uh, foreshadowing in and through Descartes, especially in Kant, of a kind of dualism mm -hmm. of the intelligible world, qua intelligible, the noumenal world, as uh, Kant calls it, and the world of appearance, right? Uh, so that's not, it's not at all full-blown in Thomas, but there are glimmers of that. He, he, he kind of quite indeliberately sets up the possibility of what we come to take for granted in modernity. The first major step is Descartes, who looking back at Thomas, takes seriously the fact that the human mind is a very dubious thing in every sense of the word, and that's not going to be very good for creating a scientific method and a way of thinking about the world, the natural world. Um, that's not going to be very good for doing that mm -hmm. um, if we let it stand that way. So Descartes, who is quite original, dis disguise, decides to kind of like, I was going to say take the bull by the horns or turn the bull, take the bull by the horns, but turn the bull inside out, so to speak. So if everything is dubious, well, let me start doubting everything I can, and maybe I'll find something I can't doubt. Okay. So he's he's kind of longing for this certainty that he sees oh, in, the absolutely. Greek, in the Greek world, but he sees that it's not here. Did you say Greek world? Yeah. No. In some way. No. No. It's not no. similar to that at all. No. He wants some kind of certainty, though. Yeah, but not in the Greek world. There's not no the, certainty in the Greek world. Analogous. Well, I mean, there is certainty, there is right? certainty in the late Greek world in the negative that it, there there is skepticism, which alleges it doesn't allege so much that I can't be certain, but what it really alleges is I can't know anything. There's not even the question of certainty in that act of knowing not, in the Greek world. Not, so it's, yeah, it's, not in the Thomistic sense. Right. Thomas uses the word certitudo uh, frequently, right? So it's part and parcel of his thinking. I would say it's part and parcel of this developing self-consciousness, which nevertheless is ne not yet and will not be in Thomas full-blown. Right, right. right. Um, it's a cat which is still in the bag, right? right? But in Descartes, the cat gets out of the bag, and the question of certainty and doubt comes to the fore. Right. Um, and so he has to, yes, Descartes is in, um, in search of a foundation for thinking that he cannot doubt, mm. which you could say is certain, right? And of course, that's the famous conclusion of a non-syllogism, I think, therefore I am, okay? And that he can't doubt that while he's thinking, he is, no matter what. And by the way, that doesn't mean he's a man. It just means he is. Mm. So he could be a tiger or a leopard. He could be a doorpost. I mean, he doesn't put it quite so grossly as that, but that's what he's saying, literally, right? All he knows is that he is what he is. Now, notice he's already disconnected existence from essence, mm. do you see? And there is a kind of disconnect in Thomas. To say more about that, the disconnection of existence and essence there? Well, if I, I is. I is, but what I is is a, I have no idea mm. at that point. See? In order to know what I is, I need to know, what, which is the ultimate reach of his doubt, uh, 
I need to know, know more about the reality of the natural world in which I would have a context for saying, well, I'm a human being as opposed to a zebra. Mm -hmm. Do you see? So as long as the only thing I can be certain of is that I is, then de facto I've called into existence. And by the way, I'm skipping the methodology that he went through, right? Mm -hmm. He doubts his body, doubts everything. Right. All the doubting he does is whether he has a body, right? Okay, well, if you don't have a body, what species are we going to put you in, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, he, goes, um, he goes through the doubt, and, and so if I, if, I, if I break through all the bric-a-brac and say, well, so then what, what's the difference between Thomas and Descartes? The difference is that if I take that same term that I used in Thomas, transcendental form of natural reason. In Descartes, in and through the methodology of the uh, doubt, I have broken out of that phrase. I have cut and put on my clipboard, I may or may not paste it back in, the word natural. So what I've got in Descartes, qua doubta, not yet having been able to convince himself of the reality of the natural world, including his own body, uh, that appears to be real to him, but he can't, he can't sign off on it. He's cut and paste and put on the clipboard for future use. The nature part, the natural part. So he, what we're left with in Descartes, fundamentally, the originality, is the transcendental form of reason, period. Mm. And that gives us, in, De in Kant, you know, this notion of pure reason. Uh, and the problem with pure reason in Kant will be pure reason is pure reason, right? But a, the world of appearance is something else, okay? okay? So it all makes it, when I say there's a history of thought, I mean, it's not just, it's not just turning the pages, right? There's a, there's a structure, there's a, there's a real uh, dependence and variation based on that dependence going forward. Okay, so what we're left with is a transcendental form of reason. But that transcendental form of reason now is a full-blown subjectivity because on the side of the object is everything but the ego. Ego cogito sum, right? Cogito ego sum. Ego cogito ego sum. I mean, it can be expressed or not, but I th I, there's an I in the cogito in Latin. Right. You can express it or not. Is the question of the humanness there even, is it still a question for him, whether or not the I, the ego, is a human for Descartes? Well, not foundationally. Not foundationally. Not foundationally right? um, so, but we have a kind of pure subject, a pure, we have not only now borrowed, I would, uh, my, my more technical notion is that what, in Descartes we have the appropriation by what turns out to be what we call modern man. The appropriation of the transcendental form of reason, the form of which appropriation quite consistently takes the form of reducing the transcendental form of natural reason in Thomas to a purely subjective transcendental form of reason. Right? And subjective in the sense that then the problem for Descartes right away in the meditations is how does this subjectivity that I ha can have no doubt that I am qua existent, uh, how does it relate to the natural world? I noticed again in reviewing some of my uh, stuff uh, in anticipation of the interview, somewhere, I don't know where, I came across the notion, it's probably in Novitas Mundi, but it may be else, no, it may be in Faith and Philosophy because I do Descartes again in a more um, um, precise way, uh, a fuller way. In, faith and philosophy, uh, that in effect, if you stop and think about it a moment, uh, not in a way that would um, uh, go down uh, uh, with Augustine or even with Thomas, but nevertheless, it sets up that pure subjective transcendental form of reason that can be there for sure whether or not I have a body, whether or not it has any basis for understanding its similitudes to correspond, as they did for Thomas, to reals, realities, real things, is interesting enough, and I don't think it's entirely lost on Descartes, although he's very modest, 
Uh, it's very, it's, it's a self-conscious way of understanding how the creator would have been before the creation. In other words, the, the creator before the creation would be what? It would be a mind, an intellect, that would, right, uh, without going into the Trinitarian relationships, right? But uh, an infinite intelligence in, in Christian understanding. Uh, and if I imagine... If I imagine, I can only imagine it, but if I can imagine the mind of God, the creator God, before he created anything, it's at least a formal analog of what Descartes comes up with in the meditation. So he's a little God, right? He's, a, he's an idea of God, but he's, an, he's the idea of God through and through, right? In that, in that, at that moment in his meditations. So that's the beginning of a full-blown foundational notion of subjectivity. We don't have that previously in history. Right? And we've been working our way through that for the last 500 years or so. Um, and it has all kinds of specific um, outworkings, uh, the most, perhaps the most uh, profound of which would be the, the thought of Hegel, which is the thought of an absolute self-knowledge as, as the nature of the divine mind, in which absolute self-knowledge uh, creatures are, um, the existence of creatures is in the technical sense merely ideal. In other words, the, the, the world created by the absolute self-knower of Hegel, the abs if I can call it that, abs the objectivity created by the absolute subjectivity uh, that is the divine being or mind in the Hegelian understanding, um, in that context, the world that it creates, or the entities of the world that it creates, have, in a technical sense, a merely ideal existence, which means they have an existence, the truth of which is not their own. Uh, so you could say that they are there to be, and the famous idea of the Hegelian the dialectic is the Aufhebung, the sublating, the supersession of the finite entities and the, and the world of the finite over against the infinite self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there, as it were, literally, both almost metaphorically, and, but certainly ontologically, as but a moment in the, uh, in the mechanism of the dialectic. It, it has, uh, put it boldly, the created world in and of itself has no truth for Hegel. It has a truth, but it's not a it's not a truth that it has in itself, right? It's sort of the finite in and of itself is its own nothingness. Um, There's some phrase there that I, I'm trying to remember. Okay. It's the, the, um, the something about the, the being of the finite is the... the um, what is the phrase? Yeah, the, the most succinct and profound way in which Hegel puts it, which is quoted by me in a couple of places, I think, at least one place in, um, in uh, Faith and Philosophy, I think, for sure and maybe elsewhere, is that the, well, let me give you a little context for that, though. Uh, so when, he, when Hegel turns around and he looks at Kant, right, so Hegel is doing his major work at the beginning of the 19th century, and in the 18th century, Kant is, is the embodiment of what we call the Enlightenment, right? Uh, but Kant was a dualist, right? And um, so... Um, uh, not, not only is Kant a dualist, but he kind of, uh, what's the word, he subtleizes, he, um, um, he introduces all kinds of important nuances into the, to the questions that Descartes kind of passed over. Um, I wanted to say, I'm going to just interrupt myself and come back to this. When Descartes entered in, oh, I said when he entered into the meditations and he was going to doubt everything, it, it's important to realize that when he did so, he tells us elsewhere he first set aside from his doubt, he excluded from his universal doubt, his faith and his morality. Mm. Right? Uh, little did he know right, uh, what, what the implication. So he was doing, you could almost feel for him. You know? In other words, he was a pious guy, he went to Catholic school. <laughs> so, they were going to doubt his faith. And he had no need to doubt his faith. <laughs> they were going to doubt his morality. He's a good guy. Right? Okay? 
All he had to do was doubt this whole understanding of how we know the world as a natural object of scientific endeavor, right? And so he was very modest, he restricted himself very carefully. Of course, that, went, that gradually went by the boards in very interesting ways. One of the ways it went by the boards was uh, one of the steps, major steps, would be Kant. And in Kant, um, the question of the existence of God, so, so Descartes, in the meditations, even though he's doing science, even though he's not in his own mind, and I mean that almost literally in the case of the meditations, he's not relying upon his faith or his morals, which he elsewhere tells us he's excluded from consideration. But nevertheless, qua knower, right, qua subjective transcendental reason, he is able to prove to himself, to his own satisfaction, in two different places in the meditations that God exists. Now this is important to Descartes to prove that God exists because if God exists, the corollary of that for Descartes is that God is a good guy. Strictly speaking, he's infinite, that is perfect being. And perfect beings, good guys, infinitely good guys, they don't screw around. They don't, they don't play games, right? They don't, they don't lie, they don't cheat, they don't deceive, right? So he needs to prove that the infinite being of which he has an idea, and of which in a certain sense he is the finite addition, um, that that infinite being uh, is, um, exists. Simple, exists. He has two different proofs, and it's an interesting what the difference is between them and how it plays out in, in Kant and Hegel, but I leave that to the reader who might pick up faith and philosophy to see that in some detail. But whereas Descartes can prove to himself, apart from faith and reason, uh, apart from faith and morality, mm -hmm. that God exists, uh, they, uh, Kant can do no such thing. He can't disprove that God exists, Kant. So he's famous for what are called the antinomies, right? So he, has, he gives arguments pro and con. And one is, one is meant to understand that they're equally compelling, right? So it's kind of undecidable, right? In other words, Badiou did not invent undecidability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I mean, undecidability is a great cop out, right? I mean, we don't, just, it's undecidable, right? Okay. So uh, Kant establishes, for example, that the existence of God is undecidable. But one of the proofs, I'm speaking broadly now, I'm not quoting too closely, but the basic assumption of his, when he proved, when he does prove that God exists, which is not conclusive, it's based on the fact that the being of the world requires a god to have brought it into existence, and roughly, roughly, or at least ontologically to be its cause. Uh, when Hegel takes a look at that, it drives him right up the wall. Right? And he, so he wants to, Hegel is a kind of grandiose Descartes, <laughs> right? He also, he also, it's not so much he wants to start from scratch, it's more negative than that. He just wants to leave all this stuff behind, right? Including especially Kant, who was very close to him, and of which his, uh, his horror is, is the flip side of his profound regard for him as a thinker. So he goes right to the heart of the matter, and he accuses Kant of falling into the same trap that all proofs of the existence of God, from Aristotle up through and including Kant, are guilty of. For Hegel, the, 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 the mistake, the fundamental mistake at the, at the beginning is that they all assume that the being of the world. <laughs> and they start, if the world exists, there must be whatever, right? There must be some kind of causality, divine or otherwise, right? However you slice it, right? If the world moves in Aristotle, there must be an unmoved mover, right? You see? Okay. Uh, Hegel, just to show you how radical Hegel is, Imagine the analog, applying the analog. It's like saying to Aristotle, why do you assume the world is moving? <laughs> right? uh, now, he doesn't do that literally, but I'm just showing you it's a really to say, to challenge the notion that the world, the finite world of our experience, actually bees, that it exists. That's what Hegel does. Right? It has no being of its own, that's what he wants to say. And then he goes on to say, and this is what you're referring yeah. to, it's precisely, however, in the profundity of the depth, the, uh, almost the infinite depth of the dialectic, um, 
and it's precisely the non-being of the world which is the being of the infinite. Mm. Right? Uh, the only way you can account for the finite, which has no truth of its own, no being of its own, why would it even come up if there wasn't an infinite being from which, in one way or another, it derives mm -hmm. its, its ideal and momentary being, ontologically speaking? Hmm? OK. <coughs> All right, so. So they're somehow always related in Hegel. They're, all, they're connected. Oh. They're never. Oh, yeah. There's something that you speak of in your work where there is a kind of absolute otherness that somehow starts to. Right. At the heart of what. There Hegel is a. Is talking there, about. Yes, but it goes back to something we hit on earlier in the conversation that uh, the modern mind, and Hegel would be the example par excellence, is. Um, uh, unable to get beyond the notion of necessity. I mean, get be unable to get beyond it is, um, yeah. well, it would be more true of Peirce. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, Hegel makes no attempt to get beyond it, right? So uh, It's given for him. It's a given, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. well, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's needed for his thinking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what freedom there is, is subordinate, as it were, to necessity. Freedom is a, right. a, a mechanism of an outworking of what is understood to be an, a, an eternal and necessary actuality, right? And, and within that eternal and necessary actuality, there is development. There is development, right? But there is not, and that would account for, in the broad sense, the, you know, what change there is over time in the world. There is development, but there is no, literally, interestingly enough, uh, he was too early in the century, I guess, um, there's no real evolution, right? Um, okay. So I think that's enough to try and answer the first question uh, uh, so far. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that it, by, by which I mean enough, I don't think we need to go into it in this context what comes after Hegel and so forth and so on. A lot of, a lot of stuff comes after Hegel, as Kierkegaard and Heidegger and Husserl and so forth. There's a, kind of, there's a kind of pushback within the limits of a Hegelian, a, a fundamentally uncritically assumed truth of the Hegelian mm -hmm. synthesis uh, on understanding. And then we have this thing called postmodernity, which is um, a bunch of gray cats running around in the dark, right? Okay. Um, and a kind of unraveling with nothing, nothing really taking its place, right? The kind, I, I would, this is a kind of personal judgment, but I think it's valid. Uh, you know, it's a kind of a, it's kind of a, it's the form of, it's a form of a kind of ultimate intellectual despair in the wake of what appears to be the exhaustion of the absolute self-consciousness embodied in the, in the thought of Hegel. So over against that, that so that's the background mm -hmm. in terms of which we can understand what one of the ways in which the thinking now occurring should be understood. So if I take the term analogously to the way that I use the term transcendental form of natural reason for Thomas, and I think of the thinking now occurring as captured in that term, thinking now occurring. I can, however, substitute other uh, phrases that would be speaking of the identical thing, as it were. Uh, one would be an essentially new form of thinking, or essentially new form of thought. You, when you ask the question, you add it on for the first time, which is good, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to bracket that a moment. Okay. Um, um, it's almost implicit in the notion of an essentially new form of thinking that it's essentially new. You, you suspect that it hasn't been there before. Okay. Although I'm not sure it's a necessary uh, conclusion. Um, so if I've already conceded, for example, that in a certain sense, not necessarily that I would want to um, ascribe it to Augustine personally in the way I, the originality, the kind of originality, he's original, but, but he's more, much more heavily under the influence of faith than Thomas, who draws a distinction between faith and reason. He introduces a kind of bright line, red line there between the two. They're not incompatible. They're not opposed to one another as they will come to be in, in, in Kierkegaard. Uh, but they're certainly distinguished in a way that's not the case in Augustine 800 years previously, right? Um, but, but my larger point here is that 
in one form or another, there have been, in the course of the history of thought, new forms of thought. Right? The clearest and most explicit new form of thought would be Descartes, the, the thinking that comes out of Descartes, and then it gets modified and trans, transfigured and so forth in Kant and Hegel. Um, but I want to say that the thinking now occurring is an essentially new form of thought. So what does that connote in the context, right? And w the first thing it broadly and generally connotes is the notion that in this thinking for the first time, that long-standing self-reference that we can trace back certainly into Augustine, um, I mean, I I'm speaking qua thinker now. I mean, uh, people like to take Augustine back to Paul in this regard, right? Um, but Paul is not, he's not in the sense in which we're using the term in this context, he's not really a philosopher, right? He's not really a thinker in this more restricted, narrow, and specific sense, although he's thinking, he's thinking mightily, right? And he's creating, as uh, N.T. Wright uh, points out in his uh, fourth volume of his magnum opus, Christian Origins, uh, he creates Christian theology, right? I mean, uh, um, so I'm not saying Paul doesn't think or he isn't a great thinker. He is a great thinker, but he's not thinking about thinking. I don't like that expression, but you get the idea what I'm talking about. He's not, he's not, he's not doing anything like what Descartes did. He's not focused on, the, on what can be thought. That's not, that's not Paul's problem, right? Okay. Uh, he may be focused on how, how the incarnation can be thought, to say, but it's not a generalized uh, investigation that he's conducting. Okay, um, so an essentially new form of thinking. Um, one immediate uh, connotation of that is that that self-referential element that's there in Augustine, and kind of blossoms through the Middle Ages up to the High Middle Ages, and comes to the fore uh, in the thinking of Thomas Aquinas and maybe in its own way appears <coughs> in the subsequent centuries, right? The intermediate centuries, uh, the 14th and 15th centuries, as we get more, more and more close to what we can recognize as, as modern thinking. Uh, that whole development, if I can, for want of a better term, right? Speaking not too technically, development, outworking. I like outworking better, it's less, it's more open. Um, is left behind in the thinking now occurring. In other words, self-reference, even the relatively innocent self-reference, I would say, of that you'll find in Aristotle's text. Right? Um, Aristotle certainly understands in his ethics, for example, as a concrete thing. Um, no matter how great the magnanimous man is, uh, that is the man who has all virtues, uh, and therefore the man whom you would expect to exercise all virtues, and therefore to treat everyone else with perfect justice, et cetera. Um, when push comes to shove, part and parcel of that, and the anchor of that magnanimity of the Aristotelian magnanimous, absolutely or perfectly virtuous man, to the extent to which any, have to be careful here, right? Uh, to the extent to which any human being, even for Aristotle, can be perfectly perfect, uh, nevertheless, is grounded in self-regard, right? Uh, there's a nice uh, uh, Homeric analog that kind of embodies this. I said that Aristotle is like Homer. He's got many gods, right? 55, 47, depending on how you're counting. He's, a, he's an ontological polytheist. Well, the classic uh, 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 story of Achilles uh, in the Iliad, where he sends his friend, his bosom buddy, the, the guy he, no one greater than whom he loves in the world, Patroclus out to fight Hector in his place, given the circumstances. Uh, he does so reluctantly. Uh, he warns him on the way out to be careful not to go too far. Uh, if, Hager, if Hector retreats, don't follow him because you know, you're liable to go too far and you're liable to lose your life. If he stopped there, well, yeah, that's right. We would say it's kind of Christian of him. Isn't it? No, no, he doesn't stop there. Uh, Achilles says, and you might not lose your life, but you would deprive me of the glory of doing that 
Hector in, mm. right? So as, as much as he loves Patroclus, he does not love Patroclus more than himself, okay? And that's reflected in the ethics of Aristotle in much more subtle and uh, sophisticated ways, right? Okay. And then, but, but it's constrained. It's not, it only comes out at the extreme. In the case of Achilles and Patroclus, it wouldn't come up if the extreme circumstances weren't there in the story. And it wouldn't come up in Aristotle unless he had to consider, you know, what ultimately, what, to what, to, what is the object of my regard? Ultimately, it's, it's, it's me. It's who I am. Okay. But it's restricted. It's not a full-blown, um, you know, self-regard all over the place. Not at all, right? Not at all. But it becomes so in modernity, for sure. Okay, um, and it, but there's a prelude to it in uh, medieval thought, and so what I'm saying, the thing now occurring, an essentially new form of thought. One way of understanding the essentially new form of thought is that there is no thought, if I can put it that way, of self in the thinking now occurring. So we have a thinking that, for which, if you say to the thinking, to, um, uh, if you start talking about the self, the uh, the thinking will say, doesn't compute. Doesn't compute. Doesn't compute. Doesn't compute. <laughs> right? Doesn't has no has no understanding at all of a self. That that's what that's what's new, right? And in place of that, uh, non, no no notion of self um, is the notion of otherness. Okay. Now otherness appears, for example, in Aristotle's text over against. What, what is often translated as, as self in Aristotle's ethics, but which, again, in terms of what I'm talking about, is the kind of very modest, spare, uh, and only extreme notion of self appearing in Thomas, uh, in, uh, in Aristotle. Uh, what is often translated as the true self or the self of a man, and for example, at the end of the ethics in the last chapter, um, Aristotle's Greek is this, this, this one, or it's each one. He doesn't use any. He doesn't even use. He doesn't even use in those contexts the Greek autos, which is often translated That's what I wondered. casually. No, 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 no. So he's not pushing self, but he is this. But maybe you think of that. He is distinguishing this one from the other, hmm. right? And so this one is implicitly a self. But I want to emphasize in the classical mind the implicitness of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's not a subjectivity. Yeah, subjectivity, yes, uh, right. That's a very good point. So when Aristotle, for example, in the metaphysics <coughs> does a little critique, tongue-in-cheek, of uh, Protagoras, who famously said that man is the measure of all things, that sounds very subjective. It sounds very modern, mm -hmm. to see. Uh, it's doubtful that Protagoras could be interpreted straight out as a modern, even though he says something that could be transposed mm -hmm. into the modern world without any trouble. Uh, and Aristotle points that out by saying, not that he had the modern-minded world, he was spared that, that, uh, that thought. Uh, Aristotle points it out and says, well, he prob what he must have meant, because he's not an idiot, he's a good Greek thinker, uh, even though he's a sophist, uh, he must have meant that the mind of the scientific man who has studied the world is the measure of all things. Because in effect, what Aristotle was saying, he has had impressed upon his mind the forms of the natural world, you see? So yes, objectivity, right? So the mind, the mind is objective, even though it, there's an implicit self-centeredness or self-reference um, to it, right? Um, okay, so I, I, I went back there because I want to say, well, if you take away the notion of self from, from, from the very nature of thinking, what are we going to do with you and me, right? So self-consciously, I would say you're, one thing is clear to me, you're, you're, other, than, you're other than me, you're not me, right? You're other than I am. And then self-consciously, I, I I, I assume uncritically that I am a self and you're other than this self. And by the way, it's reciprocal. You could say the same of me. Uh, we can both be selves vis-a-vis -vis one another. Right? Right? 
Okay. In the thinking now occurring, we can't do that because there is no self. Um, so the I that I am, so I don't want to get rid of the notion of I or ego, and I don't want to get rid of the notion of person, right? Um, so I want to say that the I or the person, which are almost always interchangeable in the thinking now occurring, although context is always important, um, is another. I is another. I know it's, it sounds like street English, but I is another, and you is another, okay? We are both others, and in fact, he's another, all right? Uh, we got nothing but others, okay? Now, the advantage of having nothing but others is that we get rid of Sartre's uh, famous line, that hell is other people. <laughs> I was in that play, by the way. Okay. I was the one who said that in that play. Okay, yeah. So we All get right. rid of that phrase. Yeah. Yep. We get rid of that phrase because you can only say that or think that, you see, if yourself, right? But um, the distribution of otherness in the complete absence, uh, absence is a misleading word, the complete non existence mm -hmm. of the notion of self puts all others, all these others, however many there may be, on an equal footing vis-a-vis -vis one another. In other words, no one is at the center, right? Or, if you want, and I sometimes do this in foundation in more, uh, not necessarily on this particular topic, but ontologically and logically, uh, no one is at the center, or the center is everywhere, right? Uh, that is, as many others there are, each is a center. But even that is a little misleading because the idea of center and circumference is, is passe with it, right? Or the inside and the outside, or the notion uh, in the self-other logic, the notion built into the otherness of opposition, mm. right? So once you re eliminate the notion of self, all persons, all eyes are others, and as such, as far as that goes, they're on equal footing, and, they, and what that means concretely is that ontologically speaking, they have nothing to lose or gain by the existence of the other. More precisely, they have nothing to lose or gain in their being, right? ontologically speaking, by their relationship with the other. That is, they, their dealings or their relations with others become completely objective or free, right? So the vanishing of the notion of the self takes with it the notion of subjectivity. Of, and, and then I have to say, because Heidegger kind of deepens in a post hegelian universe, he deepens the notion of Cartesian subjectivity and the absolute self-consciousness of, of Hegel. He goes underneath that, but when he goes underneath, what he discovers underneath that is self Dumb. Selfhood, right? So uh, he's got a foundational selfhood or selfdom upon which he would understand in the past the self-consciousness of Hegel and, so, and the metaphysical tradition uh, has uh, been built, but they themselves were not as profoundly um, um, true to the nature of being as as Heidegger understands it, uh, as they, as they, perhaps ought to have been. And what's the consequence of that in Heidegger's thought? Is uh, I mean, he just becomes the ultimate champion of selfdom, or um, what about the you know? Because you mentioned something about despair in the postmoderns. What's his relationship to that um, that space of despair? as you see it working out in the postmodern world and his relationship to it. Is there a relationship between the, the selfdom and, and despair? Uh, well, I, I hesitate to attribute the notion of despair in any um, <coughs> ordinary sense mm -hmm. to Heidegger. Um, Although I, I, I'm inclined to associate his notion of resoluteness, uh, the being toward death, mm -hmm. authenticity. I want to say, but I, I, I want to say, but I want to qualify because I don't want to, I don't want to say more than I actually think or have thought through, right? 
Um, I'd be inclined to associate those notions with a kind of um, um, response to, de to, to despair. In other words, a kind of um, um, a kind of, I mean, if I were to think in more, again, more traditional terms, a kind of different forms of what otherwise might have been known as hope. Uh, but then hope and despair are, in some sense, uh, alternatives, right? To have hope and not to have hope. I mean, that's what it means is despair. So there's a kind of, um, um, I, I think the safest thing to say off the cuff, so I, because you're asking a question I haven't really thought through. But off the cuff, I would say it's a kind of, um, um, Response to despair in Heidegger, mm -hmm. right? a kind of, a kind of, uh, a path of avoid of avoidance of despair, some something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I, as I say, it's a, it's a question that, as such, I haven't really considered. Well, he doesn't end up in a world where there are others. There's still a self in his particular world. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. An yeah, ultimate self. Yeah. So you mentioned that there was a coming together of otherness and objectivity. And, you know, I can kind mm -hmm. of hear people screaming in the background about, you know, you can't claim objectivity and, uh, you know, there's everything is subjective and, you know, kind of yeah, colloquial yeah. phrases like that. And, you know, so what do you what, what exactly do you mean by um, this uh, objective world? That well, I think the objection to it, I, I once ran into a guy like yeah. that who, uh, when I was trying to explain to him shorthand, uh, thinking now occurring, just quite a number of years ago, and I don't remember who it was. <coughs> and uh, when I mentioned objectivity, wow, he, you know, he almost blew a gasket, right? <laughs> I think the objection to uh, the, uh, the notion that a world of absolute others is a world of objective relations, um, is uh, the objection to that, and sometimes visceral objection to it, I think you, you, you pick up on that too in your question, um, is a function of uh, a, a self-attachment. Hmm. In other words, if there's no self, what's the problem? Uh, in other words, how should I deal with the other? Well, I should deal with the other as the other should deal with this other, right? I should do so fairly, justly, or whatever, or appropriately, uh, depending on, you know, whatever the issues might be. Um, and I can do so objectively in the sense that I'm not, my self-interest is not weighing avowedly or unavowedly on the scale of my judgments in dealing with the other, right? Uh, so I deal with the other uh, in principle in terms of what is the good or the reality of the other. Right? So, I, so I've, I've heard the objection, but I think the objection begs the question in the, in the sense that um, well, if you continue to assume there's a self, well, I understand why you're upset. But if there's no self, then, then my claim to objectivity is not a deception mm -hmm. to gain what is really my own self-interest. Yes. Do you see? So, I, so, uh, so if there's no self, there's no, no, there's no possibility of that kind of masking. So with the, the kind of leaving behind of the, the world of the self and the self, there's words that come to the, the surface in your thinking. You know, I, I, I see person that's still there, singularity, particularity. Sometimes those are even mentioned together. Mm -hmm. um, say a little bit more about what the personal is and how it relates to singularity and, and particularity. Uh, Actually, as you're pondering that, I have a, an interesting quote that I really liked from, okay. from Beyond Sovereignty, your latest book. Um, where is it? Do you know where it is? Yeah, this is on page 10 of the uh, preface, the Roman numeral 10. Okay. And you're talking about personal identity. Mm hmm For the first time... Where, where are we on the page? Um, personal identity is, I believe it's down... Um, let me find it real quick. Um, it's about three-quarters of the way down. Mm-hmm. Um, on page Roman numeral 10. Yes. 
you see the, the new notion of neighborliness articulated in this context? Yeah, I got it. So a little okay. bit farther down there. Okay. So for the first time, personal identity is conceived essentially as absolute nimus, at once absolute singularity and particularity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So parse, parse that for us. A bit. Uh, well, in reading it, or rereading it, um, uh, you asked about particularity and singularity. And again, one of the things, um, as I always tell my classes, is that when you're doing um, anything like something philosophical thinking or technical thinking, <coughs> you need to always keep in mind the context in which words are used, right? So this is a more general statement. Uh, there may be a context in which particularity and singularity would not necessarily uh, appear together, but the, obviously they're not at all incompatible. Um, which, well, so let me start with the singular. Um, I, I would associate in the thinking now occurring generally, and in my mind as I'm speaking, I would associate the singularity of the person uh, with its uniqueness. Um, qua uniqueness, right? In other words, it's um, um, in a certain sense, it's unrepeatability, right? It's um, um, I think uniqueness speaks for itself in English, right? Okay. Uh, whereas particularity connotes um, that this unique thing, person, and by the way, even though I said thing, I have no objection to saying that. And I'm thinking now occurring. Everything is in one way or another personal mm. uh, for reasons which we haven't gotten near yet. Uh, so this person, this singular being, in its singularity is absolutely particular, right? Um, or it's or the person is absolute, an absolutely particular single, single, right, if I can put it that way. Um, and by that I mean, and here we get into kind of the logical dimension, which is by no means incidental to the thinking now occurring, whether it's traditional logic or uh, real trinary logic, which is a new form of logic corresponding to the essential, essentially, essentially new form of thinking. Um, logically speaking, the notion of a, an absolute particular, or more generally absolute particularity, as another way of speaking, by the way, of absolute otherness, every other is a particular, and in the context absolutely so. Um, the particularity there that's at stake is, in terms of the classical syllogism, it's the middle term in the uh, series of premises, the two, the two premises leading up to the conclusion of a syllogism, right? So the universal term, uh, all men are mortal, the particular uh, term, Socrates is a man, so you, you can see right there the statement itself is quite particular, right? Um, all men are mortal is a universal statement. So in the thinking now occurring, I want to say a minimal way of putting it, and again, it's going to be as difficult as anything else in the thinking now occurring to get your head around because it overturns the thinking now occurring. It was essentially new. Just let's face it, okay? You're not going to get your head around it. <laughs> well, uh, not initially, right. not, not easily. It unless... might get itself around you or something <laughs> right, like that. Right, right. Uh, or, you know, uh, it doesn't rule out miracles, right? right. So, I mean, a miracle <laughs> might think about it. Uh, <clears throat> but in other words, it's uh, not to be expected to be a piece of cake. And it's, it's expected that it's going to, almost anything importantly said about foundational notions is going to be uh, difficult to grasp at first blush, right? So I'm going to try and put it gently. So between the universal moment and the particular moment, between all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, is a man that classical distinction, which goes back to the agents, right, somewhat 
uh, truncated by uh, Descartes, although he still uses the uh, ah, he still uses the particular and uh, conclusion moments of the classical. He leaves out the universal. Mm. Right? Uh, I explain that just to make an aside uh, in faith and philosophy, in uh, casual language here, more, more technically in that book, uh, as his as a function of the fact that he needs to demonstrate. Uh, that there is such a thing as all men, <laughs> uh, and that they are mortal. In other words, he, the universe was not a given for Descartes. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doubting everything. You, you follow? Right. Okay. So there's a certain consistency in his inconsistency in having a syllogism that's incomplete from the get-go. Mm. Okay. But going back to the classical syllogism and the thinking now occurring, uh, absolute particularity connotes the notion that the particular does not depend upon the distinction of itself from the universal. Okay? In other words, it's not, the particular is not subsumed under the universal notion of man, but you could, you could almost say that there's no place else that I find the universal man. There's absolutely no place other than in this particular man. Right? Um, so if you think about that uh, logically, uh, then that suggests I may not have to go to the conclusion, right? Or in other words, it collapses, thinking now occurring. In that sense, immediately, that, the key word here would be immediately collapses the syllogism, truncated or otherwise, right? As we find it in truncated in Descartes, untruncated classically in Aristotle, among other, many others. Um, it's, it's that in order to uh, state a true proposition about any thing, any person, any being, uh, I don't need to go through the intellectual motion of the syllogism. Keep in mind that Hegel is very clear, and this becomes clearer in my dealing with Hegel in uh, Faith and Philosophy um, in uh, chapter 7, um, uh, Hegel is very clear that his dialectical uh, divine mind is really a, uh, I don't know whether he uses the term, but he might just well have, he should have if he didn't. Uh, he means it to be a living syllogism, right? So in other words, the dialectical process uh, from the infinite to the finite to the recouping uh, of the infinite in and through the finite moment, that, that circle that, right, um, is really uh, the, uh, is, is the living syllogism in Hegel. Right? So uh, one way of understanding the thinking now, so absolute particularity, uh, it would apply, therefore, if I took one of those three elements of the syllogism as the singular moment, it would, the same logic would apply as that I'm trying, I'm, I'm focusing on a particularity because it's, it's uh, kind of crystal clear, the, the particular moment, the second moment. Um, so whatever particularity uh, the person is, is absolute in the sense that it want of a better term, it's part and parcel of the being, the very being, the very identity, the very uniqueness of who that person is, uh, is particularity. It's not unique in a bald or unscripted sense. Mm -hmm. I could, right? uh, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not unique like you could imagine, you know, a lot of cue balls. Uh, they're all the same, but, but there are many of them, so they're all other than one another. Mm -hmm. right? But they don't have any distinctive markings. No, no, no. Every person is absolutely distinctively marked, not only unique, but distinctively marked as such. Because the cue balls on the table are also unique. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It brings to mind a couple of things um, around the notion of species. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this, and I don't even know how we came upon this particular conversation mm -hmm. we we're having a few years ago. But it was about, um, there were two notions. There was one notion of human beings being the species-making species. Yes. 
And then the second that notion... Appears, that phraseology appears in uh, Section 5 of uh, Foundation. Foundation. Yeah. And I don't know if this is related or unrelated or maybe a separate thing, but you said to me in conversation one time that it will turn out, even at um, the level of our DNA, that in some way each particular human being is its, for lack of a better word, its own species. Yeah. That the speciation of us as absolute particulars right. is so specific and so unique that it will be shown that as if people came from another planet or we we're extraterrestrials or something like that, that the human race itself in some way is that specific. Right. I don't know. What's the reference to uh, uh, aliens? Well, you know, sometimes when people sit around and think about other species coming to visit us, it's right. like, whoa, we're already amongst other species. That's right. what I got out of this, this kind of off-the-cuff okay. remark you yeah. made to me. And well, of course, you have a great disadvantage because I generally don't remember anything I've said in the past. Do you remember and, this? <laughs> uh, no, but I, can, I don't actually remember saying that. Yeah. However... Uh, it resonates with what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can imagine that I must have said or may have said something quite similar mm -hmm. to your uh, feeding it back to me. Um, and in the context of the discussion of an absolute particularity, then I think, yeah, I think you could say that <clears throat> in, the, um, in that same logical framework, the species is another term for the middle term, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, more, uh, even more abstractly, the, the other term for species or the particular uh, would be essence, hmm. right? Um, so you could say that every person is, you were right to bracket its own. Sure. Okay. Uh, but every person is... Uh, Ah, I like this uh, just for its uh, uh, socio-political uh, connotation. Every person is essentially particular. Essentially, a person is essentially um, every person is essentially I wanna, I'm, I'm trying to get the right phrase for it. Not its own essence, but um, every person essentially exists. Exists essentially. Um, you know. And when you use that term, essentially, can you just can you say a little bit more about that term? Well, it, it again, again, it's context. It's context. Here, it's functioning. It came in yep. because of its association logically with species and middle term, um, <coughs> I think Aristotle would use the term essence and does it. But it's really not. I don't have to think this. <laughs> Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's term, which I, I, I um, take off with from uh, in Novitas Mundi is uh, ta, ti, ain, ain, I, which literally translates the what it was to be, hmm. what it was to be. Now, that goes back to the distinction between reason and intellect right. in Aristotle. Reason knows the essence of something. Qua reason, it knows that essence at what, as what it was to be in the act of knowing. Memorially. It's always a memorial? Well, it's a past. I don't know whether it's a memorial, okay. because I think it's a kind of a black box in this to the relationship between the act of knowing, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure that it remembers right. explicitly, right. but... We'll leave that for the levy. <coughs> yeah, all right. <coughs> but it... <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> pardon me. It... Um, okay, so... But that what it was to be, mm -hmm. the whatness, which is one of the notes I strike in um, in Nobody Does Monday, it's obvious, but it's doesn't hurt saying the obvious. The whatness is another, it's an English word for the, for the essence. What is it? We were talking about Descartes. He didn't know what he was. He knew what? He knew for sure, based on his uh, method, that he existed. But he didn't know what he was. He didn't know his essence. Okay? Um, so, so where I'm going with that is that I think another term which we haven't used yet 
which I would associate uh, in a very important way with the term essence, is intelligible, the intelligible. The reason the essence is the middle term, is the species, is the, um, the particular, is that is the intelligible element without which there is no knowledge. Right? Um, so the um, Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I don't know. That you could you could pursue it with me if if I haven't gotten where you where you want to go. But uh, essentiality is intelligibility, and another broad way of understanding the thinking now occurring is that ah, um, I said thinking now occurring is equals an essentially new thinking, an essentially new thinking, a new intelligibility thought for the first time, to bring in uh, your uh, uh, suffix from before, right? A new intelligibility thought for the first, first time. time. And I would add to that, I've, in recent years I've been adding, um, it's redundant, but it, it, it uh, makes things ex more, more concrete. Uh, a new intelligibility thought for the first time, always and everywhere. Um, and that gets us to something we haven't talked about now uh, yet, and that's the now. Yes. Because there's a multiplicity of nows, as it were, um, and uh, uh, the world that we're in the thinking now occurring, creating, is always being created absolutely here and now, right? um, or more simply, it's always being, the world is, is being created. I wanted to, I'm, I'm being pedantic with myself. I want to get this so I can write it down somewhere. Uh, the world is created always and everywhere now. Right? If I want to complicate a little bit and bring essence back in, the world is created always and everywhere, absolutely and essentially now. Right? Um, and therefore, I could, I could play with that and say, created always and everywhere, absolutely and essentially now, uh, is created absolutely now as intelligible. Right? Uh, so it's intelligibility. I don't know who was some Indian Pasha, right? The turtles all the way down, somewhere like that? OK. In the thinking now occurring, it's essence all the way down. Yeah. But it's not the same essence, right? Uh, it's not the same intelligible. But it's the nature of intelligibility that it is, now I'm doubling up, mm -hmm. the nature of intelligibility that it's essentially change. Right? So, um, yeah. The nature of intelligibility is essentially change. Yeah, intelligibility, uh, what we've gotten beyond is the, um, the static forms. Right? So for Plato, the, the true beauty was a eternal, unchanging form, right? Right. All right. In the thinking now occurring, the distinction, and that, and that depended upon the distinction which Aristotle makes explicit in his own original way, uh, it implicitly depends upon a distinction between form and matter, uh, between potentiality, which is associated with change, and actuality, which is associated in the Greek mind with, with no change, right? In the thinking now occurring, form and matter are not so distinguished. Mm -hmm. Worse than that, there is no potentiality in the thinking now occurring, or possibility in traditional terms. There is no matter that is not, as it were, at once actual. There's no possibility that isn't actualized. So if you, if you ask me, as I know you're inclined to do from time to time, is it possible? In the, uh, uh, well, it, it may be possible, but if it is possible, it's actual. Mm. Right? Uh, so there's no future in the thinking now occurring. And the category of the future is a, is, a, is a mirage. That's not an entirely new discovery, but uh, it's uh, categorical in the mm. thinking now occurring. And you mentioned about the now that it's um, multiple. Was that correct? Did I hear you say that? Yeah. And is that related to? Um, well, I mean, it, it's multiple in the sense that 
Well, it makes me think something particular, okay. and I think okay. the question is around the the essential, the essential, the essentially existing singular individual person okay. is existing now, and there are multiples of these existing others. And okay. I wondered if you meant that the nowness of um, the the multiple of the the nowness is in that particularization of the um, of the particularization of persons. The multiple. Well, I would say in the particularization, qua particularization, uh, the multiple. Uh, yes, the the multiplicity or the multiple qua multiple is taken without limit, right? So in other words, uh, mm -hmm. if I go back to my analogy, you had a, a pool table with a lot of cue balls on it. Yeah. Uh, they could each be unique, but unmarked. They're all unmarked, and as such, indistinguishable from one another, except what? Except depending on where they were on the table. Mm -hmm. But that requires taking seriously the notion of space, and I don't want to completely upset the apple cart here. <laughs> But in the thinking now of Curry, there is no space. There's no space, There's no space to put the, put the marbles on, right? Okay. Right, right. Um, so uh, if I'm going to distinguish <clears throat> the others one from another, there's no self-reference. There's no, there's no pre-existing center. Um, uh, and I'm going to take the notion of their multiplicity thoroughly, through and through their multiplicity, then I get to the, I get almost, I've already, it goes without saying, I've, uh, I'm at the notion of an absolute particularity mm -hmm. of, of, of the multiple, mm. of the multiples. Right. It also reminds me of uh, a moment in one of your classes, uh, this was years ago, and I think we may have been reading Novitas Mundi, where we were talking about a pen that was uh, a writing pen that was mm -hmm. existing on the table in front of everybody. Okay. And, um, you know, we could say the same thing about this book, I guess. So mm -hmm. when you and I are looking at this particular book, mm -hmm. this person, this thing that's sitting here, mm -hmm. are we looking at the same thing? I'm looking at the identical thing. You're looking at the <laughs> identical thing, right. And what do you mean by that? What's the distinction between sameness and... Uh, well, we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at a thing whose identity does not depend upon our point of view. <laughs> so assuming... Okay. assuming Assuming that there was some legitimacy to the, which is built into your question, to the, the question uh, itself. To, well, no, no, no. <laughs> 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 and to the more particularly to the category or the point of view. I see. So I think, but I think it's a question that, um, you know, given that most people are still living in a self-conscious world, that would come up in terms of, because a lot of people think of when they hear the the question of identity. Right. I think a lot of people immediately think sameness still. Oh, yeah. They're right. not, they're yeah, not right. thinking in this uh, way which really right. distinguishes sameness from um, identity. something that's identical. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree that. I mean, yeah. But I'm not sure that's my... Right. <laughs> I don't know what I can do about that. Right. Oh, well, I'm doing what I can do about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's identical, this particular object that's here that we're seeing. Right. It's not the same. So no, it's not. It's not the same. Even even our modern science, in its own, in its own way, yeah. would tell you right off the bat that despite appearances, it's not the same. Yeah, and you're not the same, and I'm not the same. And and so the 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 sameness would go back to this notion of there being some kind of center that that holds things together. Something some something that is immune to change. Something that's immune to change. Right, and we, and it's com and it's a comfortable idea. Right, right. whereas the. The thinking that's the thinking now occurring for the first time would hold that the, this the identity of this book the identity of anything that mm -hmm. called a person which as far mm -hmm. as I can tell would be any particular thing the microphone the, yeah yeah um, well uh, uh, just for the sake of the audience uh, that might be viewing this I want to say <clears throat> in the thinking now occurring personhood goes all the way down, right? So right. things that we traditionally would not think of as persons, like a book, in the thinking now occurring, is a, is a person. Right. However, that personhood is qualified in uh, the second appendix to Beyond Sovereignty, to this person. Uh, I distinguish categories and relations of persons. Mm -hmm. And so this would fall into a person qua material, mm 
as opposed to you and I, which in the thinking now occurring, who are understood to be persons essentially, right? Um, so there are, there are distinctions within uh, the range of personhood, right. But, right. Uh, but yes, there's no, nothing impersonal about the, about the world. Right. And so just to yeah. finish up this thought about the sameness and, and mm -hmm. um, identity. So th the reason why we're not seeing the same thing in this new universe, mm -hmm. the reason why we're seeing an identical thing, mm -hmm. is that in some way this thing is change itself, that it's uh, essentially... Um, to put well, it's the, uh, it's that this notion of change itself being thoroughgoing is. Uh, yeah, I want to say that um, how did you phrase it? The reason we're not. How did you put it? The reason why there isn't something that's the same that we're seeing right. is the fact that there isn't something static. There isn't something that's centered that's that, keeping it right, being. Right. But but there is an identity. And, that is and the change. identity is not, uh, you could say the identity is change itself. Mm -hmm. Now this raises a, a, a deeper notion in my mind, um, which again I was thinking about in anticipation of the interview, <clears throat> and that is, I come up, I think the phrase probably occurs in foundation, uh, but it's uh, employed uh, more explicitly in, uh, in uh, Beyond Sovereignty. Um, Foundation is a book in which I, having done Novi Testimony, having, as it were, having it occurred to me and having worked out initially okay, what the thinking now occurring was in what I, I would call broad strokes. In Foundation, I, I was trying to get down to the nuts and bolts of things, and I wasn't spending too much time um, I was just discovering. Uh, foundation is, is, is a, all my texts are difficult to read, more or less. Foundation is particularly difficult because not only was I doing the thinking now recurring, which is hard to digest, but I was doing it in, in a way that I was more interested in digging up, unearthing, bringing to the fore various uh, important aspects of that thinking without necessarily pursuing them further, right? So in a certain sense, with the passage of time, Beyond Sovereignty gave me the opportunity to go back and retrieve some of the key ideas in Foundation and, as it were, I don't think it's the right word, but apply them or uh, flush them out in a more, more particular context. And one of those ideas is the notion in the phrase, absolute discontinuity of the, 